Mad scientist death rays go together like fish and chips, gin and tonic and Chinese takeaways with MSG. These were legitimate coat wearing inventors on the edge of the spectrum. Cripes, the story even has a genuine isolated island, armed patrols to protect the secret project. Had these scientists spent their pent up furtive minds unsuccessfully designing say a cat door or a lawnmower, their failed inventions would long be forgotten. Only what these mad buffins were working on had serious military potential. The age old holy grail, a super weapon with the destructive capabilities to render others obsolete. Scientific developments in the 20s and 30s pointed to such a wonder weapon being a distinct possibility. It wasn't until 1938 that an atomic bomb was first mooted. In the preceding two decades, top of the bill were death rays. A beam of energy that could shoot down aircraft, disable battleships, paralyse whole armies in the field, make the concept of modern warfare as it stood at the time obsolete. Their imaginary destructive powers even led them to be called a diabolical rays. Even in the staid New Zealand press, where all the cuttings, or most of the Middle East, come from here. Literally from Russia to New Zealand, the race was on to be first. There was no prize for second. This was winner take all. The global hunt was on. And it wasn't as tall as if the scientists themselves were keeping it a secret what they were all up to. England 1924 Germany 1931 France 1934 Denmark 1936 Russia 1939 Nor were the rays evidently designed for just incinerating armies, navies and air forces. The ray guns had other commercial applications. Pest destruction and prevention were at one point thought to be a godsend when it came to rabbits. You'll see from this cutting that originates from Germany. Crims were in the crosshairs from a known lethal blast from a ray gun that wouldn't be out of place in the original version of Flash Gordon. One only needed to read the newspaper of the day to realise death rays were considered plausible on the cusp of reality. This wasn't a case of if, it was a case of when. In fact, one of the biggest fears governments, even the ones as small as New Zealand had, was the fear of not taking the claims of scientists seriously, even the tin foil hat ones. They were able to bamboozle sharp pencil bureaucrats with ease, placade for a time mainstream scientists, this being largely or entirely uncharted territory, as you'll see from this cutting from 1925. Death ray inventors weren't adverse taking their product to the open market, selling it to the highest bidder. What if it worked? Casting that net wide actually resulted in Great Britain staving off German invasion in World War II. The British defensive early warning radar called Chain Home was an offshoot of scientists' experiments into a death ray. The unqualified tinkerers from your average garage were thus taken seriously with their claims they were onto something. And historically, one thing New Zealand has had a plenty is men tinkering in garages. This story is about one of those, Victor Penny. Before I progress this one, there isn't a lot of concrete info on Mr Penny, just one photo and clearly you're looking at it. His fate post the story and resting place aren't even known. Some of what I have to play with looks also to have had the f holes filled in to the point fact and fiction have now become one and the same. What we do know was he was born in England in 1900 and was never involved or trained in the field of electronics. When exactly he arrived in New Zealand it falls through the cracks. We do know he was married and his job at this point was in an Auckland garage, this point in 1935-36. Prior to that he drove trucks, was a cabinet maker and owned a taxi. The first inkling that behind this mild manner persona was a world breaking inventor 
and break through electrical engineer of some kind was what he was demonstrating to the New Zealand press in this, the only remaining photo. A microphone condenser, the fate of which I'm presuming went down the gurgler. The microphone, my dulcet voice, the one that's bored a thousand ships, I'm using this very second to record this, is one of those. Behind the scenes was also a gyroscopic compass for use in submarines, which according to Penny at least, was first offered to the New Zealand Navy, somewhat optimistic since the New Zealand Navy didn't possess a single sub. Anyway, they passed it on to the Royal Navy, who apparently knocked on his door one night out of the blue. I took his only copy of the design notes and it was made standard on all British submarines going into World War II, to which he asserts he didn't even get a thank you. The meaty part of this intriguing story, the bit you've tuned into about death rays, begins in strange circumstances. An assault that occurred on the 19th of June 1935 upon Penny, at his place of work, the North Shore Transport Company. In the lead up, Penny had trumpeted his latest creation, Post Microphone. He called it a Radio Marvel. Now, this is where fact and fiction meet the rumour mill. Radio Marvels didn't sell newspapers, and Death Rays did. The New Zealand press ran with Death Ray, leading to wild speculation as to the capabilities of Penny's creation. Those included that the ray was capable of detonating explosive even beneath the earth, igniting a box of matches with an invisible beam at 20 feet, and in a uniquely only in New Zealand experiment, the invisible ray had vaporised a flock of sheep. Allegedly, I must emphasise. Not everyone was buying what he had to say. In some quarters, no pun intended, he was called Half Penny. Within the publicity for the ray come Marvel, the self-promoting Penny raised the spectre I'd mentioned before. He had already attracted the attention of overseas interests, unwarranted, some of it, hostile in nature. His loyalties, he claimed, lay with the Empire. The last thing he wanted was groundbreaking technology falling into the hands of the enemy, read Germans. The authorities took all of this seriously. The Royal New Zealand Air Force had undertaken a review as to the invention's credibility and given it an initial pass mark. So they were now serious about keeping him safe. The army was given the task of guarding Mr Penny 24-7. Only the night of the 19th of June, the allocated guard was off sick. An injured and unconscious Penny was taken to the hospital and then recuperated back at his house. Check it out! A nice array of radio wires to distinguish itself from the neighbours. His security was ramped up and plans were made for him to be shifted to a secure location, well away from the prying eyes of the press, as well as the yet to be verified of phantom operatives. New Zealand had just such an ideal place at the other end of the North Island. Somme's Island. Whilst I'd like to portray Somme's in the same vein as King Kong's home, it wasn't anywhere near as mysterious or remote, lying just two miles off the coast from suburban houses surrounding Wellington Harbour. Interesting, not remote. Even by 1935, it had seen its fair share of colourful occupants, the first being Maori, using it as a refuge in the 1700s, through to it acting as a quarantine for both humans and animals. In World War I, it had become a prisoner of war camp for 300 Germans, as well as local citizens deemed a threat to internal security. It was all but set up and ready to go. All that was needed was to convert one barrack into a living quarters and the other as a laboratory. Surround the enclave with barbed wire and searchlights. Allocate a small detachment from Trenton military camp and it was all but impregnable. <laughs> History and the science would teach us Penny's enterprise was going down a technical cul-de-sac that had plagued his peers in the field of radio waves. What is more impertinent to this story is a pulse of light radio waves were miles away from a death ray. For all intents and purposes, he was on SOMS to develop a radar. Hush hush, a nod's as good as a wink. His Achilles heel would prove to be he couldn't control the frequency of pulses. Thankfully, that major stumbling block was solved by a British team behind the chain home early warning system that was integral winning the battle over Britain. 
It was now the beginning of 1936, six months on little old Somme's. Thousands of pounds spent on the project and nothing to show for the efforts, and thus the government pulled the plug. Penny was sent packing back to Auckland. Ever the optimist, he saw this as but a speed bump in the whole scheme of things, telling the press, I'm not worried at all. I know what I have, and I haven't finished my work, not by a long way. The Prime Minister of the day, Peter Fraser, wasn't so glowing about his industry and the taxpayers' overall investment. He stated to Parliament, When we questioned the poor fellow, a child could tell there was nothing in it. It was as good as a bedtime story on the radio. Fraser's scathing a summary became the legacy and millstone for Penny. His reputation was in tatters and he went back to his tinkering and died in obscurity. What is my appraisal? Penny was quixotic, undoubtedly staged the attack to pump up his own claims, ditto a gyroscopic compass story. Moving that to one side, from a technological standpoint he was not the fool that others had painted him. Couldn't and wouldn't though, except the path he was following was going nowhere but up the garden path. Had he branched out to one side, Penny could well have beaten more illustrious company to the goal. Nor was it he that was pumping up the line of the death ray. That was largely down to the press, and he was never one for turning down publicity when it benefited him. Then he learnt the hard way the press weren't always sympathetic. This was also high stake stuff. Had a death ray been a genuine reality, the possessor of the technology would have ruled the planet. Thus a huge industry was spawned which Penny exploited. Not the money, he was after fame. A small fleeting touch of which he got. And by the way, Somme's Island also appears in one of my earliest videos. When a German mine layer sailed up Wellington Harbour in 1941 and deposited 10 mines on the bottom of the harbour. Share and share alike, Littleton got the same number as well. Not one of those has ever been recovered. There's a link for that interesting story below. And thanks to my loyal audience, I am at pains to make it clear I have projects on the go, left, right and centre. Even I don't know what I'm about to do next time. Stick around and find out. Bye for now.